Oh no, someone said that you can't hear me. I'm so sorry. Um, right, we are back. Hello, welcome to Seas Biology. Um, I'm so sorry about that. I just have not clicked the button. But um, I'm here. Um, welcome back to Mr. Seas Biology. Thanks for tuning in. Um, sorry about the technical issues. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at cell division and the cell cycle. Um, we're going to look at stem cells and cell transport. Um, do let me know if you can actually hear me now. It's nice to know if, if it is working. Um, there's some yays and stuff. Excellent. Um, fantastic. So um, we're going to start off by looking at cell division. And this is the thing that um, cells do in order to divide, in order to make more copies of themselves. Um, good to hear that everyone's everyone's here and everyone can hear me. Um, so I'm going to get my... Um, uh, we'll move down the screen a little bit and we're going to look at this diagram here. So um, we're going to talk about the process of mitosis today. There is another process that cells divide by called meiosis um, and that is especially for um, cells that need to divide and create half the number of chromosomes inside them. So um, things like sperm cells and egg cells will divide and create um, so, so, uh, copies of themselves through meiosis, um, but mitosis is what every other cell in the body does, uh, including from an embryo, when they start off as a single cell, they will uh, start with a single cell and are carrying out this process of mitosis again and again and again until you are a fully fledged human being. Um, meiosis is also for plants, it will be for their pollen cells and for their um, egg cells as well. Um, but for mitosis, which is what we'll focus on today, we might touch on meiosis um, another day, but for mitosis, there are three main stages, and the purpose of it is that we can have these um, chromosomes, which I've drawn roughly here, and they have um, stripes of genes on them, and they've got DNA inside it. Um, we're trying to get copies of these chromosomes from one generation of cells to another generation. So cells that, are, that start off, and they want to be able to pass on their DNA, they need to pass it on as accurately as possible, and they need to um, be able to pass it on um, to you know, regularly again and again and again to many cells so that we can end up with lots of different cells. We can repair parts of our body as well. We can grow other parts of our body by making more cells. So it's a really important process. And there are kind of three main parts to it um, when we're looking at GCSE level. I'll touch on a few other parts, but um, a few other stages, but three, three parts we need for GCSE. Um, the main part and the longest part that most of your cells will be in right now is interphase. And I, if you imagine that this, this is a, a pie chart, and uh, then this large space here is interphase, loads of time spent in interphase, and that is cell growth. And so when a cell is waiting for itself to divide, it's going about its normal cellular functions, and um, that's interphase. And so interphase takes, takes a long time, because the cell is trying to double in size. And all the things that are inside a cell that a cell needs, it needs to make a second copy of, because then when the cell splits, it needs to be able to, both cells need to be able to have the right amount of things. And so the main thing that's gonna happen here is the doubling of DNA, because then once the new cell has a full copy of the DNA, it can then make its own proteins, it can then carry out its own job without any extra help, and it can just do that by itself. So the main thing that we're doubling there is DNA. So we're creating an exact replica, an exact copy of it there. Um, the second thing that we're going to, uh, that then a cell does is that it is going to, so after interphase it's, it's grown, um, it's grown in size. The second thing that it does is then it uh, splits the DNA first. And so that's the phase that, um, that we might refer to as the, my, the mitosis phase. Um, so the DNA splits in half. And then the, um, the third phase is uh, where the cell body itself pinches and forms two separate cells. And so that is cytokinesis. If you like your origins of words, and this is an interesting one, so cyto means cell. So we think of our cytoplasm, cell, and then plasm meaning kind of jelly, so it's cell jelly. Um, here, cytokinesis is just a movement of this cell in order to pinch and form two separate cells. So it's the final thing that happens. And as soon as that's happened, then those two cells that we've created will then just start growing themselves. And they will go into interphase, they're, they will start trying to do their normal function, and eventually they'll start doubling the DNA and preparing themselves to split again and to continue growing. 
So if we move down, and you can see I've got a cell at the bottom here, the first thing that we have, so we're talking about interface now, so I'll put it back in my blue. Um, we've got a cell, it's got a nucleus inside it, and the nuclear envelope, so the, the, the bit that wraps around the outside of the nucleus, that needs to disintegrate before the cell can actually get its chromosomes out, get the, the chromosomes that store the DNA in genes. Um, we need to get them out of there so they can do stuff. And so the nuclear envelope that's around here um, dissolves, and so we get these little chromosomes here. Now, in a human, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And so sometimes we can get caught out and say we have 23 chromosomes, but we know we've got 23 pairs, which means we have 46 chromosomes in total. Now, it's good that they're in pairs. One comes from your mum, one comes from your dad. If we think back to our meiosis with a sperm and an egg, there, they don't have these pairs because one is going into, uh, they're basically going to fuse, one from a sperm, one from an egg, going to fuse, and then create a total of 46, one from the mother, from the egg, one from the father from the sperm, and so these ones will only have 23. The sperm and the egg only have 23, um, but obviously in most other cells, we want them to have as many as possible, and um, we want to have a full complement, so that's 46 chromosomes. Um, so what we're going to do is from our four, in this, in this example, it's easier rather than me drawing out 46 every single time, we'll start with four, and then those four will double, and we'll create an identical copy of them. Um, oh, hang on. See if this will work. There we go. Look at that. That is an identical copy of the chromosomes. And so, um, we'll, the first thing that we're doing is doubling the amount of DNA in the cell. So they've got an identical copy. So they've got all the instructions that the new cell is going to need, and uh, everything that it won't need as well uh, will be in there inside the cell. Uh, it's great to see some people joining. Hi, hello to Tim and to Blade and to Deli. Um, it's great to see you guys, and thank you for tuning in. Um, okay, so then what's going to happen next is that we've got these chromosomes. Before they've, they've doubled, um, before they're going to split into two separate parts, they need to um, line up and make sure that they are all ready to go, basically. So um, let me take these eight that we've just made. I'll copy them again and put them down here. But um, they line up in a special way. So there's a, there's a line down the middle of the cell, and these, oh, hang on. Um, tell you what, I'm just going to draw them instead. That's a bit easier. Um, but we have so we, so we have them in their pairs, and they line up right down the middle of the um, in the middle of the cell membrane, in the down the middle between the two cell membranes inside the cytoplasm. And um, we've not got a nucleus in this case because it's broken down. So this is all the genetic information. It's lined up. And then from that position, um, little motor proteins from each side pull across from each from each end. So um, something you don't need to know at GCSE, but it's quite interesting, is that there's um, a little anchor point there. There are some spindle fibers that join onto each of the chromosomes. And then they pull one from each end, one from the other end. And these chromosomes that are sitting nicely together, they split and they get pulled to each end of the cell. And so what we end up with is we end up with a cell that has started to split down the middle and we have our four chromosomes over here and our four over here. And so that we're back to our normal, normal amount of chromosomes in a cell. There's only a brief point in this stage here and this stage here um, where we have a double number of chromosomes in the cell. Most of the time um, it's got the, the normal amount. And in the final stage, this is the cytokinesis stage, is that the cell starts to pinch in the middle. So it goes from being quite a round shape to then starting to pinch in at the edge of the um, cell membrane. And then we can almost imagine along that dotted line, it's going to continue to pinch and it's going to end up forming two identical cells. And those two identical cells, uh, they've got the same DNA, they've got, they're about the same size, they're going to have the same kind of material inside them that's going to enable them to do a normal job. And then the nucleus reforms and we go back to being our normal cell. So what the cool thing is that actually when we look down a microscope at some cells, most cells at the time will, will look like they've got a nucleus. Most cells will look pretty normal because they're just in their growing interphase. And every so often we can catch a cell in the act and you can see some amazing photography, of uh, microscope photography of these cells caught in the act with 
chromium's half pulled and there are some amazing videos out there i don't have access to any myself uh, without um, copywriting anything but i would recommend and i might put a couple of links in the description afterwards to things that i'd recommend um, um having a look at because it is fantastic and you think how are these things working together and they're moving so quickly in order to end up um, creating these two identical cells so that is the process of uh, mitosis um, good to see a few more people as well hi jasper and simon and um, good to see you as well and hunter man as well great thank you for um, joining thank you for commenting uh, it's good to see you right so let's talk a little bit about stem cells i think that's the main bit about stem cell division um, i know pearl originally said that she had a test on it so if you have got a question pearl i'm happy to put it in the comments and i will see if i can answer it um, as we go but let's move on to stem cells so stem cells, we've got a few different uh, types of stem cells, a few different things that we're going to mention. So in uh, a stem cell, let's start off with a definition, is a type of cell that can become a different type of cell. It hasn't quite de decided what type of cell it's going to be, and so it has the potential to be a different type of cell. You can imagine it a bit like um, if I start playing football, I'm not very good at football, I don't really know what position to play. And so I go along and I play, and I maybe end up playing in defence, and actually, no, oh, it works quite well for me, and uh, I've become quite good at defending. And someone says, oh yeah, maybe you should try, try defending on the left-hand side. And these are the kind of things that you learn if you defend the left-hand side in a football match. And so I might start to learn, oh, those are the kind of things that you do. And so beforehand, I was someone, a bit like a stem cell, I could play anywhere because I didn't know anything. I didn't know what, what the specialist skills were for the different positions on the pitch. When, uh, when I get told that, when a cell learns that and learns what its role is going to be, it starts to differentiate. And then after that, it can't go back very easily to turn into something else. So, for example, uh, a cell could start to become um, a, a nice nerve cell. And after it's become a nerve cell, it can't then turn into a muscle cell because certain genes have been switched on to say, yes, this is how it works. This is, this is the things that I need to do, the proteins that I need to make. And certain genes... If we switched off, things like the muscle cell genes will be switched off, so it doesn't, can't make those sorts of proteins, it can't work in that sort of way. And so it's only turned on only certain parts, so it's differentiated, it's finished, it's specialised into a specialist job. So uh, that's pretty cool, that's how stem cells work, and we get stem cells in embryos, adults and plants. Those are the kind of broad categories. I'm not saying that if you're a teenager, you don't have any stem cells, um, but we often classify things as adults, stem cells, when we talk about actually... A human being who has been born so they're not embryos uh, but obviously you're not an adult um, well not in the UK legally until 80 um, but your, your stem cells don't know that unfortunately so an embryonic stem cell um, I can see that Simon's mentioned in the chat a word called totipotent now what he means by that word is it has the potential it's from the same word potent um, has the potential to become anything. You think of the total can mean all, so it's all, it has the potential to be anything. And so uh, an embryonic stem cell can become any other type of cell. And that's great because as an embryo, you want to be able to make cells of the whole human body. Okay, you're not really making plant cells, but with the DNA that you've got, you want to be able to make any type of cell. And so they have to be totipotent from the start. And what's interesting is that they do lose this totipotency quite quickly uh, and actually when the cell, uh, when you end up with a ball of cells that's looking a little bit more like it's got a head end and a tail end, then actually those cells that are at the head start to um, actually specialise to be at the top of the body and other ones become at the bottom of the body. And so they become pluripotent, which uh, just means that they're able to do many things, but not quite everything. Um, and so pluripotent is, is often how we refer to uh, embryonic stem cells. Adult stem cells, uh, they do have the potential to become lots of different things, but actually they're, they're very limited in their category. So for example, a good example of adult stem cells is bone marrow cells. So bone marrow um, can turn into different blood cells. And it could turn into a white blood cell, it could turn into a red blood cell, could turn into lots of different types of white blood cells. Actually, there are T cells and B cells, lymphocytes, neutrophils, all sorts of different names we have for white blood cells. And the bone marrow can make any of them. It can start off with these um, stem cells and it can make any of those different types of cells. Um, but it can only make blood cells. If you'd ask the bone marrow, 
to make a different type of cell, it wouldn't be able to. Um, good to see a couple more people there. Hi to Aditya and to Casper. Good to see you guys. Um, so when it comes to plant cells, this is a little bit different. So plant stem cells have plant stem cells are found in the meristem. So you might, if you think of a root that looks a little bit like this, um, and the root is growing downwards, it's got different zones in this root. So right at the tip, there are um, there's actually a group of cells around here that are um, it looks a bit like a fingernail, doesn't it? And there's a group of cells that are going to protect the, um, the, the root as it's going forward. That's the root tip itself. Um, but just above that, um, there's a part called the meristem. And the meristem is where we are going to find these stem cells. Um, and so the stem cells come from here. And as the root moves downwards, these cells start to differentiate. And they start to form different jobs as they then move up. The root because if you think they're actually not moving themselves they're staying still but the root itself is growing down and so the bit that was the bit that could differentiate that had lots of different stem cells is now the bit that actually we want to do some things like moving water up and down and moving sugars maybe protecting the cell might be even be a photosynthesis if it's high enough up and almost in the shoot rather than the root and so we then after we've had the meristem we have different zones like the zone of elongation where these cells go from quite circular to uh, a bit more uh, like we expect a plant cell to be like, that kind of rounded rectangle, longer cells. And so the plant stem cells start in the meristem and they move up the, the, the sections of the root to become um, specialised in the cell. Um, plant stem cells are interesting because they can differentiate later in life. So differentiation doesn't just happen as an embryo, but differentiation can happen uh, again and again. So um, if we think of an adult stem cell, uh, a bone marrow stem cell, it can't go back to being an embryo cell. It can't then change into any other type of cell other than a few things. Um, but plant stem, plant stem cells um, can change. They can, uh, in some circumstances, they can be put into a different situation and they can end up being um, a different type of cell altogether. So those are the kind of key facts you need to know about stem cells, where they come from, and how they work. Um, oh. Right, um, the next thing is we're going to be talking about um, cell transport. So that was stem cells at the top there, um, cell transport, and that'll be about it for today. So we're going to talk about a few different things. First thing is diffusion, and then we'll go on to osmosis and active transport. So diffusion is the movement of particles from a high concentration to a low concentration. Now, one way, one way we might think of this um, in the kind of way that we live already is that you might wake up in the morning and you can smell toast if someone's cooking toast downstairs. You might be able to smell a nice cake if someone's made it. You don't have to be right next to it. Actually, that smell that is you know, being emitted from the toaster, from the cake, um, spreads out from that, that place. Um, and ends up wafting upstairs so you can smell it even from a distance away. Now that's diffusion in a way because what's happening is there's a high concentration of these smell particles, particles that are going to get into your, your um, receptors in your nose and help you smell the chemicals. And so these chemicals are really highly concentrated, lots of them in a small space around the thing that's making the smell. Further away, there aren't any um, uh, chemicals uh, that, that make that kind of smell, and so they spread out, and then they travel, and then you can pick them up. Um, I can just see that um, Lemonum is asking, is this a high school class? So this is, I, I'm a um, UK-based teacher, so I'm aiming it at GCSE, but uh, that is the equivalent of kind of high school, so kids who are age between um, 13 and 16 kind of age. But um, you're welcome at any stage. I don't mind. Hopefully you'll learn something, whether you got GCC, whether you haven't, whether you're uh, wherever you are in the world. So hopefully it's all, all helpful or interesting or both. Um, but anyway, we were talking about um, diffusion. So these particles spread out and they continue spread it, spreading out as far as they can. And um, when we're talking about cells and diffusion, it's slightly different. So what I've drawn here is just a little dotted line and that's to represent the cell membrane. And now the cell membrane, um, obviously there's gonna be stuff that's inside the cell and stuff that's outside the cell. Let's imagine a situation where there's something outside the cell that the, the, the cell wants inside it. 
um, and hopefully it's going to get. So um, outside the cell there are a few chemicals here um, and inside the cell there aren't any at the moment because the cell wants these chemicals so it's probably just used them up. Um, what's going to happen is these molecules are going to move from where there's a high concentration over here to a low concentration on the other side. So we've got a high concentration and we've got a low concentration and there's going to be a movement of these molecules. Now it's not that these molecules look around them and think where, where's a low concentration I want to head towards that direction but it's just because if there's a high concentration of them the natural energy that they have as they're moving around remember these things are are liquids or in solution, they're not solids and so they're not in a fixed place vibrating, they're moving around and so they end up um, bumping into each other. If there's more of them, then they bump into each other more and so they spread out and eventually they get to places where they don't bump into each other more, uh, where it's a low concentration and so they don't move as much. And so they move lots when there's a high concentration and they bump into things and they change direction lots. When they get to a low concentration, they're still moving, they've still got the same energy but they're not bumping into each other, so they're not ending up changing direction as much. Um, so they're moving from this high concentration to a low concentration, and they're going to keep on moving until we've actually got roughly the same amount on both sides. So I've, I've drawn six molecules, so what will end, end up happening is that we will probably move three on average to the other side. And that's just because, um, well, I think there might have been a, a fourth one, but roughly it's... it's um, it, it evens out to both sides. And um, I can see that Simon's put in the chat that that's called equilibrium, and that just means uh, a balance, and it can be an equilibrium. I was talking about forces with um, my year eight today, and so you can have a um, balance of forces being um, in equilibrium, or you can have mo molecules on both sides of the cell membrane in equilibrium. And in that case, what's gonna happen is there are gonna be some molecules that actually will move back, some molecules that will move forward still, um, but that's okay, we're happy to have those molecules moving back and forth and there's no problem with that at all. And we'll end up with roughly the same on each side. Um, with osmosis, it's a slightly different process, um, but it's also to do with water in this case. Okay, um, So rather than uh, it being uh, just a molecule, any old molecule, it could be glucose, could be some salt or um, something else, um, osmosis is specific to water. So I've imagined a situation where again we've got a cell membrane but on this side, we, on, on one side we've got some molecules that are too big to be able to fit through the membrane. So these are the orange molecules that I've drawn already. But we might have some water molecules as well. I well, imagine we've got some on both sides. Water is pretty abundant on Earth and so yeah, I'll assume it's, it's, it's on both sides of this cell membrane. Now if you think about concentrations, if you um, have ever had some squash you might know that actually if you drink squash by itself without any water it's very concentrated it's not very tasty okay this is the kind of concentrated squash you'll buy from a supermarket if you have squash and you add too much water to it it becomes too dilute again it's not very tasty um, but we've got those two kind of extremes something dilute and something concentrated and um, now in this situation we can look down and think actually which one is concentrated which one is dilute well one of them is just water and no other molecules so that's going to be the dilute side. And the other side, there's, there's some more, more molecules and just a few molecules of water mixed in with them. So the other side is concentrated. Now, um, we've said in the, in the previous bit with um, diffusion, things move from where there are lots of them in a high concentration to where there's not much of them in a low concentration. And so the same thing is going to happen here, except just with the water. So on the dilute side, we have lots of water um, and we don't have anything else. And so the water there is, uh, the water there is uh, in a high concentration, as it were. On the other side, it's concentrated. There's not as much water uh, in comparison to the things that are around it. And so it's concentrated. So here, the water is going to move from dilute to concentrated. And it's going to aim to dilute the concentration of the other side until they're both equal. They both have an equal dilution of molecules. And I know we've been talking about squash, but this happens more with, with salt and other things inside um, the human cells. Because these cells, they need to be the right kind of um, concentration. They don't want to be too dilute. They don't want to be too concentrated. 
they want to be able to get water into them. And so they often try and manage how much water goes in and out um, by osmosis using uh, a little channel called aquaporins. If we, I'm just going to zoom in to get a bit of white space for a moment. Um, if we think of these cells and if we put them in different solutions, different things will happen. So imagine I've got my cell there with a cell membrane and I put it in a solution that has lots and lots of water in. So if I put it in a solution that's really high in water and really low in any salts, we'd call that a hypotonic solution. Now it's hypotonic, you might know that the word hypo means there's a low amount of something and the tonicity, tonic in this sense, it's just talking about the amount of salts and sugars that are in it. So if we have a hypotonic solution, then what's going to happen is that our, our cell is going to burst. Oh, not quite that badly. But um, it's going to burst, there's going to be some holes in it. And the reason for that is because our water is going to enter the cell and just keep on entering the cell because there are things inside the cell. And that means that it's slightly concentrated. There's no, nothing other than water outside the cell. And so the water moves from where there's lots of it outside to where there's not much of it inside and that floods the cell and if it's an animal cell without a cell wall it's going to burst. If it's a plant cell, let's change colour to green and I'll choose a thinner pen, um, then what's going to happen is something different. Because we have um, a cell wall there and uh, our cell membrane on the inside, we'll still get water flooding the cell um, but in this case the cell will swell a little bit so it might um, it might actually look a little bit uh, like, like this with the kind of rounded sizes, it's full of water, um, but it's not going to burst because it has this cellulose cell wall. Okay, and so an animal cell will probably burst, plant cell likely not to burst because its cell wall is going to help it out in a hypotonic solution where there's pure water outside and um, normal um, cell solution on the inside. Now, if we have a different type of solution, so rather than a hypotonic, but we might have a hypertonic. So hyper, in this case, means high. And so that means there's going to be a high salt solution on the outside. And on the inside, there's going to be um, a low salt solution, so it's more water on the inside. This time the water is going to move from where there's lots of it in the inside to the outside where there's not much of it. So you can imagine our plant cell, our animal cell again to start off with, starts off and it's got water in it and then the water's going to leak. And if it was bursting the, fir the first time because water was entering, it's going to change shape again because water is leaving. And so in this case, let's um, start again, the cell is going to shrivel. And we'll still have the cell membrane and um, we'll still have the nucleus and that sort of thing that will be shriveled up into a tiny little amount. Because um, the, the water has left it, the water has moved out. With uh, a plant cell, uh, slightly different. So um, we start off, we've still got a cellulose cell wall, and that's not going to change at all because it's fixed shape, it's going to be sturdy as much as it can be. Um, but on the inside, we'd normally draw a cell membrane that would be right up against the cell wall. Whereas in this case, if we've got our nucleus there, and then we've got water exiting it, um, the cell itself is trying to shrivel, it's trying to shrink, but the cell membrane around the outside won't let it. And so what happens is the cell membrane starts to peel off um, from the cell, cell wall. And so the cell is trying to shrivel, but it can't. And that's when you put a plant into some um, desperately salty water, or if you don't water a plant at all and it hasn't got um, any water inside it, then the, salt, the water is going to seep out of the plant cells the plant cells themselves are going to lose their structure and the plant starts to wilt. And that's because these cells have got their cell membranes peeling away from the cell walls. Um, what we call that is we call that plasmalized. Um, so we just say that the, um, the, the cell cytoplasm, um, which is the, the, the half, first half of that word, um, is lies, is broken away from um, the cell wall. If we put it in an ideal situation, um, so not too salty and not too um, much pure water, and uh, then what that is called is that it's called an isotonic solution. And in this case, iso just means the same. So when we had um, hypo, meaning a low salt solution, hyper, meaning a very strong, very concentrated salt solution, 
ISO means just right, exactly the right kind of uh, cell solution. And so then, rather than having these uh, cells that are shrinking or cells that are uh, bursting, we will have uh, a cell that is happy with some water going in, some water going out, and the same with our plant cell as well. Some water going out, some water going in, and it will stay in that happy little equilibrium as much as it can. Um, so that is osmosis in a nutshell. Moving from dilute to con concentrated, that is the key thing to remember. If we talk about active transport, this is slightly different. So the first two that we've talked about here uh, are diffusion and osmosis. Both of these are passive. And what that means is that they just rely on the energy that these molecules have themselves. They're not trying to, there's no energy that needs to be added in. These, these kind of processes like diffusion and osmosis will just happen. There's no, there's no forcing them, they just happen. And that's because these molecules are moving around with energy. And so that's the energy that they use in order to carry out osmosis and diffusion. Active transport is not passive, it's active and uh, it relies on a different uh, source, it relies on some ex external energy being put into it. So external energy, uh, we might remember from last time, comes from mitochondria, mitochondria uh, which are carrying out respiration. If they carry out respiration, that means that they are turning oxygen and glucose into carbon dioxide and water, and that is also producing some energy with it as well and that's aerobic respiration. So here, a good example of active transport is in a plant where uh, outside of the plant, in the soil, there are lots of minerals that this plant really desperately wants. Inside, it might have a couple of minerals. Uh, in fact, uh, it's gonna have quite a few because it's, it really likes these minerals. It likes to have as many as it can. Um, but there aren't loads in the soil, it's pretty scarce. Now, um, it wants to get as many as it can inside it. And at the moment, if these minerals move by diffusion, they'd move out of the plant um, because they'd move from a high concentration inside to a low concentration outside. So it stops all diffusion by, um, by having the cell membranes not, not open, there's no channels to open up for diffusion. Um, but what it does do is it has these little bad boys there that are pumps. And these pumps will be able to pump things across into the cell even when it's a low concentration outside. And so because it has this pump, it moves these molecules over to the side that already has some in it. And so active transport moves from a low concentration to a high concentration, which is pretty unique. Uh, and this is a really useful process in lots of different things. And so when we talk about having um, uh, glucose, getting glucose out of our um, small intestine into the blood, that is an active process. There are lots of other active processes in the body that we need to, be able to pump things uh, across the cell membrane. And so active transport is really, um, a, yeah, it's a very important process. Okay, so that is the main things that I wanted to talk about today. Um, let me just run through them again and um, give you a little overview um, just to finish off. So mitosis um, is the process of splitting a cell in half and keeping all the DNA exactly the same. Meiosis, remember we split a cell in half into two things and there are um, different types of, um, there's a half the amount of DNA in each one. Three main parts of mitosis. The mitosis itself, that's the splitting of the DNA. Cytokinesis, when the cell pinches and splits and interphase, that's the whole growth phase, that's the longest phase um, where it spends a lot of time turning these chromosomes into a few more chromosomes, splitting them, and then they line up and they pull apart, that's the mitosis part, and then the cell itself pinches into two, and that is the cytokinesis part, and we end up with two identical cells. Um, stem cells do this a lot because they need to be able to split, being able to turn into lots of different things. Embryonic stem cells, remember, can become anything. Um, or at least many, many things from a very early stage. Adult stem cells can turn into, differentiate into a few different things, um, but actually they're pretty limited into one category. So bone marrow can make lots of different blood cells, but it can't make a nerve cell. Plants differentiation, uh, is, which is this turning into different things, uh, can happen really easily and can happen again uh, if a cell is already differentiated. It starts the stem cells in the meristem, and then when we're talking about diffusion and osmosis, 
These are passive processes moving from where there is lots of something in a high concentration or in osmosis, it's a dilute solution, to a low concentration where there's not much of something. In osmosis case, that would be a concentrated solution where there's not much water. Osmosis, remember, if water is moving into a cell, um, then a, a plant cell, that'll make it full and turgid. If it's an animal cell, it'll probably burst. If water is moving out of a cell, it'll probably shrink if it's an animal cell. But with a plant cell, it will try and shrink, but the cell membrane, the, sorry, the cell wall will hold it in shape, and so the cell, um, the cell membrane will rip away from the cell wall and it become plasmalized. With active transport, this is active, which means it takes energy being put into it. So things move from a low concentration to a high concentration through a pump across the cell membrane. Um, and so it's really useful in plants trying to get minerals into the roots, um, even though there is uh, a pretty slow concentration in the ground. Um, that is it for today's lesson. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I'm just going to put my face on for a moment. I do really appreciate you guys watching and I'll keep on uh, making a few more videos. I've got another live stream based next week as well. So do check that out um, when it comes around. And I'll try and make some other pre-recorded videos as well um, in the next few days because I think that'll be um, worth it. Um, do remember that if you want to support this channel then there is a, a buy me a coffee link in the description where you can buy me a coffee for a couple of quid. And that's, that's great, I really appreciate that. Um, but really I just appreciate you guys watching and hopefully you can learn something. Um, so yeah, that's it for today. Uh, I'll see you next time. I'll hopefully see you quite soon um, on a pre-recorded video and then next week on another live one. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you soon.